Hello, welcome back to our lecture series on object relations concepts. Today I'd like to discuss a term that is so commonly used, narcissism, but I would like to distinguish a colloquial use of that term from understanding real developmental problems in childhood that result in um, a defensive structure that keeps other people away and, uh, and, and, and really undermines intimacy and exploits creative talents for success in the world, but the individual is inside is, is really suffering and never gets to that without treatment. So, first of all, the term narcissism is so common, and we talk about having a narcissistic culture. There was that, um, there are books on the, the culture of narcissism that Christopher Nash wrote. We often talk colloquially about someone being so into themselves and self-preoccupied or, or um, grabbing for attention and not being seemingly selfish and not interested in others. That's a colloquial use of the term narcissism. But there are, and every type of person and character that develops has their aspect of narcissism in one way or the other, but in the character disorders that have which object relations theory focuses on so much. When there are early failings in mothering and parenting, especially in the critical early stages around the second year of life, where a major disruption in self-development takes place, there are distinct character problems that become personality types. One is narcissistic, one is borderline, one is schizoid personality. And the narcissistic person is someone who has very um, polarized opposite reactions from their parents. If they're just emotionally in need and vulnerable, they're criticized, they're rejected, they're seen as weak or flawed, they are distanced from by the parent, not attended to. If they're performing with their creative talents and their intelligence, they often get admired and they get applauded and they seek then this to ward off the feelings of the inadequate mothering and parenting. They seek to always be applauded and they're always performing to get the applause and admiration. That is their way of, in a way, medicating themselves and warding off the feeling of the emotional vulnerability of a self that hasn't developed yet fully. And, and so and they're also, these narcissistic character types are always seeing others as inadequate or having weaknesses or flaws that are actually projections of their own disowned parts, parts that they dissociate and, and avoid recognizing as part of themselves. They'd rather see it in others and feel above others. So this is all part of the narcissistic idea that you're above others, but they're also acting like they're above the normal human emotional needs for contact and connection and intimacy that we all uh, need as human beings and which we, from the first days of life, need with the mother. So the narcissist can be very successful in the world or not. They're successful ones Often they go into performing arts because they get a lot of applause, but they're very vulnerable if they're criticized or not given this admiration that they need so much and this applause they need so much. They can often get very hostile and retaliatory in being very devaluing and critical of others when they don't get admired. And they can also be, or they can be a more vulnerable type where they're not as well defended and not as securely in a grandiose view of themselves where they get then more deflated and however you tend to see that more in a borderline personality over vulnerability. In the narcissist, we talk about narcissist character as distinct from a borderline person because they have this grandiose self-structure which there has been much debate about whether this is a normal thing we have that we then grow it up and modify, or whether it's a pathological structure, and I would go along with those like Ada Kernberg and Masterson who talk about it 
James Masterson talk about it as a pathological structure. Um, but when, when somebody's in the state of grandiose, the grandiose self, they are sealed off and aren't feeling the pain of feeling inadequate, and they're just seeing others as representing the inadequate parts of themselves. And they can go for long periods of time like that if they're successful in the world and they keep having, but they try to control people to constantly get the admiration and applause they, they need, so other people do get very irritated and enraged with them. And sometimes they are, um, the, they use alcohol and other things to, or substances to reinflate the sense that they are grander than they really are, to reinflate an image of their self as being so perfect or idealizing their creative talent so that they're so special that they don't have to be concerned with the normal human needs that everybody else has and they don't have to ask for things. They think people should just come for them because they're so special and perfect. They should just be worshipped, basically, as the underlying unconscious thing. Like a child might feel with a mother who's worshipping in the beginning of life. So the narcissist um, will be irritating others, but also within their own selves. As they get older, they suffer more and more. As they are less successful in the world, they, that, that grandiose self-structure begins to break down. If it can break down in a treatment situation, it's much better. And in fact, in a treatment situation, in order for the person to heal and get to the undeveloped child within, and the emptiness within, the loneliness within, that can be so deep and so dark within them, be, um, beyond the image self that they play to the world or play to the camera, if they can if they can have this breakdown in treatment, then they can get the empathy they need to heal that inner self that makes them see others in inadequate and get to the real feelings of feeling inadequate and that and the childhood experience that they're carrying with them um, of their emotional needing self having been rejected when their image self, the performing self, was so given so much attention. But no one can sustain this constant thing of always being in, being seen and admired and applauded. So they will always get enraged when they don't get that and then the inadequate self will be there and then they'll try to see it in someone else to avoid feeling it. Now we also have this narcissistic attitude in a different way in the schizoid personality who can be very intellectually arrogant but much more withdrawn from the world than the narcissistic character not out there grabbing attention but rather withdrawing and in their own mind feeling very much above people because they think they're figuring out things in the world in their mind that make them see the depth of things and the complication of things in a way others don't and so they have an intellectual arrogance that has narcissism in it but they're more withdrawn unto themselves and secretly thinking that others are beneath them. The narcissist is out there actually telling people they're beneath them, and that's why they turn off people in any kind of personal relationship, and they often alienate friends and definitely lovers and spouses. So these, the narcissism can be there in different ways. Um, the borderline more vulnerable about wanting attention, feeling cheated that they're not getting it, but not have being convinced like the narcissistic character that they actually are better than everybody else. They would like to get even some attention and they feel so vulnerable about being narcissistically ignored, the borderline often. But the narcissist who may be very... Um, much wealthier than general borderline character and more successful in the world because of the using their talents the way they did with their early mother and parents to get that applause. They work very hard to get pay and to get applause and they can be very successful. But as the narcissist gets older, something that Kernberg's written about, I've written about, they will um, always have a breakdown of the a grandiose self because they can, can't be as successful as they were when they were young and they were 
um, and, and they, other people come up and take over the jobs, positions, and they have to start feeling human vulnerability. That's very hard for narcissists. So um, there are certain clinical ways of treating the narcissist that we have had much dispute about in the field, and there's a very helpful input from many different people, James Masterson, Otto Kernberg, um, Heinz Coet, and I, I've also contributed in that area. And we have people who, uh, Althea Horner, many object relations, Melanie Klein wrote a lot about the manic aspects of the narcissistic character. Um, but what I take from James Masterson, I, in contrast to ever mirroring the grandiose self of the person when they're in therapy, you mirror the vulnerability. You mirror the underlying insatiable hunger for, for um, admiration to their talents and their specialness. Instead, you mirror how vulnerable they feel in that infant, child, and toddler part of them that is aching with a longing for mothering attunement to and, and paternal concern for their, the emotional needing part of them. It's the needing part of them that's been neglected. And so being attentive to that as a therapist, empathic to the vulnerability around how they feel crushed by not getting admiration, how vulnerable they feel, how enraged they feel, how much loss they feel of the mother they didn't have to give them that. The grief and loss and rage are essential to get to in treatment as they are in all character disorders. And as I said, every character disorder has their own form of narcissism, but for the narcissistic character, it's about when that image of being special or perfect breaks down and they no longer feel above others and in fact they can start to feel incredible anguish and guilt and sometimes even suicidally so as Kernberg has mentioned because they they realize start to realize their impact on others and how neglectful they've been of spouses children and friends when they've been so preoccupied with just winning admiration from the world to keep their sense of survival going, which depends on that grandiose view of themselves. But it uses up other people, it neglects other people, and when they come into treatment they can, and there's empathy for their own vulnerabilities, they start to be able to reach out to others. But it comes with a lot of pain of the guilt and grief about the loss of what they prevented themselves from having in terms of contact, connection, intimacy, and caring for others. And then it's a painful treatment, but a very necessary one to help them own the emotional needing parts of themselves and not to keep that child who's needing in the darkness within them and projecting it onto others as inadequacies and failings that people have emotional needs, which is their original way of looking at it and seeing it as a weakness in others. So we understand this developmentally, it really helps us to understand why there's someone can live continuously in an insatiable longing to get others to see them as being special and above the crowd. This is like an obsession and with creative talents they can win this when they're young but as they get older it, be, there's, it becomes more and more difficult for them to have a sense of psychological survival through a grandiose mirroring response to them. And they have to start to face the guilt about their lack of concern for others and the grief about the loss of what they never got and to realize how much rage they carry with them about the deprived child's self inside. and then they can be treated like other people, but it is a difficult for narcissists to come in treatment and, and admit that they need any help from another that they would feel dependent on, because what they're most terrified of is 
emotional dependence in a relationship. So the therapy relationship itself is a threat to them. And only when they're failing in the world or they get older do they come in and let us help them. Thank you. That's all for today. And we'll continue another time.